We all know our guest from programs like Dragon's Den, Newsnight, The Bottom Line, and the Today program. Um, he is loved across Britain, and we are absolutely honoured and delighted to have Evan Davis with us today. Evan, welcome. Thank you, Anthony. Thank you. Thank you very much. You're normally the person doing the interview, so if you've got any tips <laughs> on what I should be asking, do, do jump in and let me know. Um, Evan, you are a, a busy man, but somehow you've been able to find the time to write a book, and the book is called Post-Truth, Why We Have Reached Peak Bullshit and What We Can Do About It. A uh, great title. It's, in, it's coming out in all good bookstores soon. Um, but you could have written on anything, so why did you specifically choose that topic? You know, basically, I work in the bullshit industry, <laughs> and, I, and I'm very aware of that. I mean, a lot of my job is to listen to it, um, to expose it, to question it, and in a no small measure to produce the stuff. And I sit there thinking quite hard about it. And I ask myself, is this working for the person who is obfuscating or who is talking a little bit of gibberish or nonsense or being a little bit mendacious or disingenuous? I ask, is this working for them? And if it is working for them, why is it working for them? Why are we such suckers that even though this is transparent nonsense or is making no sense or is, uh, you know, the multifarious varieties of bullshit, why are we so stupid as to fall for it? Mm. Um, and then that takes you on a, a wonderful journey of exploration <laughs> as to what the mechanisms of communication are and yeah. what that person is trying to achieve by, you know, by embellishing or exaggerating yeah. uh, and why I'm kind of persuaded or convinced by it. Um, and I think essentially I've, I've, I've also got this interest in economics, Anthony, long-standing mm. sort of economics background. And the amazing thing is that economists have not only produced their own fair share of bullshit, but they've also taken a real interest in this. So there's a kind of academic study of the, of the conditions for honest communication and credible communication and when we should believe things and when we shouldn't believe things. So essentially both that economics background and my my day job or my night job at Newsnight bring me to the kind of questions around honesty and straightforwardness in communication. Fascinating. So, I mean, you saw this coming, right? I mean, this term post-truth, obviously the Oxford English Dictionary named it as the word of the earth uh, um, in 2016. But you started this in 2013. So you, you foresaw this great rise in, in the word post-truth. I didn't foresee the words, but yeah, I, I mean, look, I wasn't the first to say there is something wrong, particularly with political communication, in which the politicians have lost the ability to be frank and straightforward with the public, or many of them have, uh, and just too much of the kind of public discourse is a rather pointless, futile yeah. game in which the interviewers are getting more aggressive, trying to sort of shake them and say, tell That's us right. the truth, you idiot. <laughs> and they're getting much better at being defensive and putting barriers around what they're saying. And so a lot of us, and this is why I originally thought I'd write the book way before 2016, a lot of us were saying, we have surely reached peak bullshit. Yeah. This is something has got to change. And so yes, in that way, a sort of ahead of the time, but I don't think any of us really predicted what would come along and change it. So, mm. you know, I was thinking oh, in politics, the, the reward will go to the politicians that come across as authentic, that talk straight uh, and really kind of connect with voters rather than the ones that are desperately trying to be inoffensive and obfuscate and not answer the question. Um, and in a funny sort of way, when Donald Trump came along and broke all the rules of political communication and just did it his own way, um, I think he, in a way, made the point that the old bullshit mm. had worn out, that those old politicians had somehow lost the knack. But it wasn't quite what I suppose, <laughs> he wasn't quite what I think I would have predicted would come along no. as the sort of the replacement, because he, he obviously plays fast and loose with the, the literal truth of things. Um, so that he's a kind of an interesting phenomenon. In some ways, I think you'd say he's brought a whole new kind of bullshit to kick out the old bullshit. Right. Um, but there's still quite a lot of interesting, you know, non-literal uh, communication going on there. So that both tells you that there was something wrong before and some of us had spotted that. But it also tells you that, that straightforward, honest, you know, completely uh, simple presentation of the facts is not 
the way human communication normally goes. That normally there's embellishment, exaggeration, mendacity, nonsense. Mm. There are all these other things that bolt on. Yeah. And we just went, went from one form of it to another form of it, <coughs> and probably the next yeah. kind of communication will be a different one. Interesting. Yeah, nobody could have foresaw um, uh, Donald Trump, could they? But we're going to get on to Trump and other, yeah, other candidates like Farage and some of those in, in, in a minute. But just to make sure we get some of the definitions correct. So post-truth, for people who's not quite sure what that means, what is that? What's the Evan Davis definition? Right. So I think post-truth, as it refers to the politics of 2016, refers to uh, a whole cluster of things. Uh, it has no, I think, very strict definition, but essentially... For most people who use the word, it refers to playing fast and loose with facts in political debate. So that, I think, is what most people mean. But add on to that in the 2016 context, it means not just playing fast and loose with facts, but kind of talking nonsense that is completely detached from facts with no regard for the facts, which is a kind of, it's not lying, it's... It's just saying stuff regardless of facts and we're paying no attention to the fact. Okay. Then there's also uh, the phenomenon of, if you like, of being rather less deferential to expert opinion. So Donald Trump, for example, has said lots of things that are kind of dismissive of what the experts would say, whether it's about mm. CFCs affecting the ozone layer or whatever. Um, and I think a lot of people who use the word post-truth think of that as part of the kind of playing fast and loose with the facts. That, though, Anthony, is all the 2016 version of it. I think when you think about that, you actually realise that there's a lot of other forms of post-truth in the pre-post-truth era, if I can put right. it that way. So, really, I take it as all forms of non-straightforward, simple communication. If I say something to you that isn't the clearest, simplest, most straightforward presentation, of the views that I sincerely and reasonably believe, then I'm, I'm giving you a kind right. of, uh, I'm giving you some bullshit. So mine yeah. includes exaggeration, euphemism, uh, flannel and waffle, you know, gibberish, all sorts of things apart from pure lying. I'm not talking about pure lying. There's near lies. There's yeah. economy with the truth. There's spin. There's selective presentation. These are all in a way the kind of the big picture ways in which our communication is adorned yeah. with something other than just the simplest, barest truth. Fantastic. And then a very non-BBC word, Evan, but the word bullshit, which, uh, uh, so that is wrapped up in that definition yeah. as it's well. It's actually Somebody's... really, really hard. I yeah. mean, because obviously it's a controversial word and it sounds like you're coarsening the discussion of the subject by using the word bullshit. Um, and we debated whether that is the right <laughs> word to use. But, you know, honestly... It is very hard to think of a word that better encapsulates the phenomenon that one is talking about. Yeah, yeah. And um, I actually would not use the last half of the word on <laughs> its own, but somehow when you attach bull to it, <laughs> it suddenly becomes just the only meaningful yeah. way of capturing the full panoply of, of, of what we're talking what about. Would you say, well, out of a hundred of people that you interview, how many times did the Evan Davis thought bubble come up and say that bullshit's in there? I bet it's quite a few. Well, it is thought. quite a lot. It is quite a lot. <laughs> but look, I'm not like sitting here just condemning everybody else. Yeah. Quite a lot when I speak, yeah. I'm aware that little bubble pops up and yeah, says, yeah, yeah bullshit. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, a lot, part of what the book is about is why this is, ultimately such an irresistible form of communication. Yeah, is, is the book, is the aim of the book actually to get us all to do bullshit better then? Yes. Or, or <laughs> is it to, uh, to survive in this era of post-truth and okay. be able to separate the difference so we know the truth? Do you see what it with it? Yeah, so the aim of the book is to say, why is this such a kind of pervasive, endemic and persistent form of communication? Why is it so, so p pervasive? Yes. If we can understand why, we will understand the good bits and then we'll know what are the bad bits. Yeah. And the truth is, there is good as well as bad and there are ways in which it becomes endemic that are kind of quite natural and human. And if we can understand that, we can then say, yeah, there are areas where it's just gone too far. You know, some politicians, for quite good reasons, will obfuscate or will... We're, 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 we'll cover their, their views on a topic. 
and then they'll get stuck in a habit of doing that and take the, the bullshit habit way beyond its useful or meritorious kind of applications. Yeah. Yeah. So the idea is this is why you're doing it. Mm. This is why we all do it. This makes it potentially OK. But hang on, this would not be OK. So why, wh why push it that far? Okay. So that's really the, so the goal. So there's some components of it which are acceptable. Uh, totally. And as you say in the book, salespeople do it to try and get, you know, I might have said to uh, the publisher, this is going to be Evan's best ever interview, uh, <laughs> you know, to get you to come along. The CEOs do it with quarterly earnings, you know, so, so it is everywhere. So it's, it's OK, but there's a line. And when it gets to lying, as you say, that's not correct. It's right. worth understanding what we're doing and why we're doing it. And when you understand it, you'll spot, hang on, is this dysfunctional or is this just part of a normal human Got you. communication. Let's talk about something that may be dysfunctional. Um, so, topic of Trump and Farage. I'm not saying they're dysfunctional, but um, on 27th of January 2017, The Guardian said Donald Trump celebrated his first day in office with a barefaced lie. Uh, he said that his inauguration crowd was bigger than Barack Obama's, <laughs> uh, but within minutes, camera technology and social media had reduced Trump's boast to ruins. So, why do you feel that some politicians need to go beyond the line, as you said, to Absolute untruths and lies. Talk barefaced. Well, that's a that's a particularly interesting one um, because it's so easily falsified that you wonder what what is the point in saying it. But that is, I mean that in a way is quite true of quite a lot of what Donald Trump has said. He says stuff that is quite easily falsified. Uh, in general, the answer to the question is that what Donald Trump does is he can be quite informative even when he's saying something that isn't true because he is, by his choice of bullshit, is signalling something about his beliefs. So I'm going to take a simpler example than the one you gave. Okay. Donald Trump stood up and said unemployment in America is not 5% as they say, it's 32 I've even heard 42%. Now, it's very, very implausible that he's right about that. I mean, there's no evidence for it. It, it, it would be surprising if he was right. I mean, it's, it's nonsense, basically. It's not that high. Um, however, when he says that, he's saying to a group of people, I'm worried about you and your unemployment. Or if you're not unemployed, I'm worried mm -hmm. about job insecurity and the things that matter to you. So by the choice of his, if you like, his, his nonsense, he's actually telling you something quite informative about whose side he's on and whose side he's not on. All those experts with their fancy measures of unemployment, mm. they're not really thinking about you as a human being and your job. I am. And that's why a lot of people said of Trump in understanding him, his crowd, his audience, took him seriously, but they didn't take him literally. Got him. Now, I, I think that does describe a lot of how to interpret Donald Trump. Why he actually said it about the inauguration thing is a very interesting question because that one just seemed to be, yeah. just seemed to be, uh, you know, just did, did, didn't make <coughs> sense because it didn't really seem to signal anything. I mean, it just seemed to signal a kind of a, a, a delusion of grandeur right. about how many people are there. So that one I think is mysterious, but the others I think a lot are very are very straightforward. I mean, I, I suppose a better example than the unemployment one, this wasn't in the campaign, is Donald Trump, if you may, may or may not know, was quite a big um, fan of and participant in WrestleMania, the world wrestling entertainment, you know. He's appeared in the ring, I mean, or outside the ring. He's appeared in various plot lines. He's in the WWE Hall of Fame. <laughs> now, I'm willing to bet anyone who really thinks about it will convince themselves when he body blows Vince McMahon, mm. the other guy, <laughs> there's an element of stagecraft to that particular fight. It's not real fighting. Um, yeah. But Donald Trump appearing in wrestling is, is, is by the choice, if you like, of the platform or the choice of the forum of bullshit that he's, mm. he's selected. Yeah. He's communicating or engaging with a particular crowd. So you're learning something quite genuine about him. Right. That's fascinating because, as you say, it's, uh, you know, 
one of the reasons why I quite like watching him, or although I'm horrified a lot, is as you say, it is a little bit like WWF verbal wrestling. <laughs> uh, because you never know what he's going to say next, or who he's going to insult, and what clang is he's going to do. So, he, he and that's why he gets the headlines as he, well. He has made everybody else seem very boring. Yeah. And interestingly, his honesty ratings, so, so let's accept, like him or hate him, he often plays fast and loose with facts. His honesty ratings, I know we're not really significantly different from Hillary Clinton's in the American mm. election campaign. And the reason for that is that while he played hard and loose with facts, which for certain voters obviously is absolute no go, I mean, that just makes him utterly incredible. For many other voters, he came across as much more straightforward yeah. because perhaps unlike Hillary Clinton, he just always blurted out what he was thinking at the time, <laughs> even if it was different from what he'd been thinking the day before, which, by the way, is a very human thing to happen. You think one thing yeah. and then you think another thing. He said what he thinks. Yeah. And you could look at all the traditional politicians, the ones who've been around for many years, like Hillary Clinton, who sometimes you got the feeling they never quite said what they believed because they were trying to message it in a more professional way to make sure they weren't offending this group of voters or that group or focus group testing it or all those old techniques. Mm. So, you know, you'd listen to him and, 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 yeah, he came across, I think, or comes across as, as, as a bit more sort of straightforward in a funny kind of different way. Yeah. So the people will sort of trust his ability to shoot from the, from the yeah. calf and heart on the sleeve. You said politicians like Farage and Trump, who played on public disillusionment to claim a new kind of straight talking honesty, which is what you're talking about, you know, with Farage down, you know, having a pint of uh, lager. People like that. They think, therefore, because he's being authentic, he's being real. Uh, but you go on to say, um, which in fact, uh, the product of which skewed facts and plain untruths. So it's, it's the, it's the, the fact that people were able to be honest down the pub, seemingly very authentic, be people bought into, yes. as opposed to the detail of and, the facts. But I think it's also, it's that, the, it's that when the facts were wrong, they were well selected mm. to demonstrate what this politician, where this person is coming from, <coughs> and whose side they're on. Yeah. And actually one of the themes of the book is politics 2016, very fraught, very divided, and becoming quite tribal. Uh, quite a lot of identity and nationalism in there. Mm. And the development that made all this post-truth talk emerge was that people were putting more weight when they selected a candidate, more weight on whose side is he or she on mm. than is that person good with facts, literal facts. Yeah. Now, there may be times when you just want a politician who is like, competent, good with the facts, has integrity and straightforwardness. 2016 was not the year for that. 2016 was the year when you're saying, is this person on my side mm. or is this person on the other side? Because everyone was feeling quite tribal. And I think that tribalism was a really big part, really big part actually of the, uh, of the kind of connection between post-truth <laughs> and the politics of 2016. Fasc fascinating. Michael Deacon, uh, the parliamentary sketch writer for the Daily Telegraph, agrees with you fully uh, when he summarised the core message of post-truth, saying facts are negative, facts are pessimistic, facts are unpatriotic. In this context, campaigners can push into a utopian positive campaign to which rebuttals can be dismissed as smears and scaremongering, which is why you've got the Ramonas. You know, if they, yep. if they come up with any facts, they're Ramonas. And it's, 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 it's your point if, if you believe Trump's on the same side, who cares about yeah. the facts? But look, I mean, look, but just in case, lest you should, you should think that this is an argument about sensible liberals and, yeah. and Remainers versus these <laughs> mendacious, nonsensical talking um, dog whistle politics of the, uh, of the Trump and Farage, that's not, that's not quite what I'm saying, because of course, <laughs> there are myths and there are comfortable beliefs on both sides or all sides right. of political debate. And there are people who try and pull a fast one or people who give the benefit of the doubt to their own side, which they would never extend to the other side. And mm -hmm. so let's not think, uh, I really don't want you to think that this is just about one side. I think the one side in politics, the more populist end, has been the more interesting in communication terms yeah. over the last year and has broken rules and changed the, 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 the rules of the game. Yeah. But it's not, it really is not the case no they invented the idea of 
political deception or political exaggeration or spin or oh, come on I mean this this will be no, a ridiculous right. note yeah, yeah it's yeah. just a, a kind of an evolution of those forms That's really it. and it happens on both sides doesn't of it course I it mean does. you know the, the bottom line is the bottom line sorry but the bottom line is people uh, like to find facts or they see facts that support their already pre-existing exactly. beliefs don't they so whichever line you're on yeah, um, confirmation bias I mean another point in the book actually is the degree to which our desire to feel part of a tribe is accentuated by the sharing of beliefs. So my, my, I observe on, 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 on my Facebook timeline, I, I very rarely contribute much to debates on my Facebook timeline. Your but blog hasn't been updated I, 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 for no, a No, not for a while. <laughs> but I, I have observed, I've observed people liking posts by other people and I, I'm, I've become quite convinced that there's an element of making friends that way, that, that, that the sharing of myths in a way, or the, share, the sharing of beliefs is part of a kind of socialising, and essentially that socialising numbs the critical brain that says, hang on a minute, is this actually true, or is this right. actually, does this, is, does this really withstand critical appraisal? So, so it kind of, we want to be all cosy, we want to fit in, we want to be mates, we want to feel like a mm. gang, and, and so we so that's, that's very we share stuff. Very dangerous, isn't it? Because it can to, be very dangerous. To yeah. that point as well, da we interviewed Daniel Kahneman, the guy who wrote uh, Think Fast, Think Slow, yeah. and he said that we've got two parts of the brain. One's the thinking, the other's sort of the intuitive. And the thinking is actually the hard work, you know, the cognitive dissonance, he calls it, where you've actually got to, you know, that's why it's easier just to sort of reinforce your belief without getting to the bother with the exactly. detail, as opposed to actually having to think through the facts, yeah. it could be people are just... Uh, that, that, his book, Fast and Slow Thinking, it really did, uh, it did influence me quite a lot because yeah. he, in a way, he is... Economists come at all of this, you know, they really think very hard about why would anyone believe something that was likely to be untrue uh, or which they would... If you would say it anyway, whether it was true or false, you saying it gives me no information whatsoever. Mm. And economists keep asking, why would people believe it or why would I listen to you if, I, if you would say it anyway? And Kahneman, that's really the economist with their rational model of the world. <laughs> and in all sorts of areas of life, economists have had their rational model of the world. Mm. And Kahneman, who got his Nobel Prize in economics, right. came along actually and said, it's, 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 it's the non-rational bits stupid that explain everything. And you, as soon as you just stop remove that assumption, it all falls into place. That's right. And, and that, that <coughs> intuitive thinking side, the system one thinking is a big part of it. Yeah. yeah. And without that, you go into dangerous stereotypes and yeah. populism and everything else. Um, I'm sure that Daniel Kahneman will say that your book influenced his next one as well. So that would be, <laughs> <that'll> be <laughs> good. That would be a good, good place to be. Um, let, you mentioned um, uh, before that we are, you know, you mentioned in the book that we're actually living in a, a post-truth world, but We've kind of always been. Exactly. You said, you know, yeah. So the point isn't that it's just suddenly started. You mentioned that Henry VIII was at it as well. So do, do, do we need to, as leaders, and if you're a political leader, need to exaggerate to get the headlines, to get the attention? Because facts on their own, as you say, are just quite dull and boring. Right. I think, I think where I think the politicians and political leaders... Um, so first we need to accept they need to communicate and get across a point. And clear communication is not always the most straightforward communication. Um, they need probably a bit of theatre to get attention. Uh, good stories are the way human beings absorb information. That is a better way to get a point across than dry statistics or a policy paper. So if you're a politician, you probably need to frame stories and stories may have elements of simplification, exaggeration, or connections be drawn that frankly are not quite as, as sharp as they should be. So I think politicians need to do that. I think, and in the book make the case, that they sometimes need to obfuscate. Mm. Uh, if I'm a politician, I may have a message. I may not want to distract from my message by talking about other things. So I may come on to talk about Brexit. I may be a politician. You may want to talk to me about high pay, um, what I'm going to do about bankers' pay, I think I, as a politician, would be sensible to say I'm not going to talk about bankers' pay because 
I want to talk about Brexit today. And if I right. talk about bankers' pay, you won't listen to what I say on Brexit. So there are all sorts of ways in which I think politicians ought to, uh, ought to you know, think carefully about communication. What I think they shouldn't do, and this is where I think it went wrong, really, in the sort of heydays of, of political spin in the, in the 2000s, was you should not think that the spin can defy gravity. You shouldn't think that an answer to the problems of the health service is a good line in a press release or a speech that says we put money into the, to the health service. That mm. isn't an answer. And that's not going to work. I mean, if the health service hasn't got enough money, saying because you've cooked up or creatively cooked up some figures to pretend it has, that isn't actually going to solve the problem. And mm. it might get you through the next three days in the headlines, but it's not really going to it's not going to make the health service better, obviously. Mm. And so the point was <coughs> that because you should think carefully about how you message and what you say and what you don't say, doesn't mean you should think that messaging is the answer to the problems that you have. And I think we did get to the point where the messaging tail was wagging, if you like, the, the kind of politics dog. Yeah. And politicians got to think that if they could got a, had a good answer to a question, it was job done. That was just ridiculous, obviously ridiculous. Same, by the way, with executives mm. who think if they get through the next quarterly results and they've, it, it's been a, it looks like a good quarter, uh, that they've run the company well. Mm. But they haven't necessarily, you know. And, and so it's, it's a matter really of, 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 yeah, it's a matter of, of not c overstating the importance of communication. Good communication matters, yeah. but it isn't. It, it, it's a small piece of the of the job. A, right. a, a friend of mine, and this, I, I keep using this analogy because it makes the point for me very clearly. Watching the um, the swimming relay in the Olympics, he's a mathematician, and he said, "I'm surprised they keep talking about the order in which the relay team swims, because it's the same four swimmers, the same speeds, presumably. If they're whatever order you put them in, you know, you're going to get the same result." Mm. Um, now, of course, he's wrong because the team psychologists know that there is a better order and a worse order and you want this one to go last and you want this one to go first. And it's all about the way the team interacts and yeah. you don't want to be too far behind at this stage because it makes a difference to the performance. So, yes, the swim team order does matter. That's like the communication. It does matter. But let's not pretend that the good swim teams are the ones that only think about the order in which they swim. No, of course, you've got right. to have the good swimmers. <laughs> so you've got, to think about the, yeah. you've got to think about the message. Right. Uh, but you mm -hmm. really, really want to make sure you're thinking about the stuff that you're messaging more than you're thinking about the message. That's right. But that obfuscation, I mean, it's, uh, the whole of the country, for, by the way, for people who haven't watched Earth or read their thesaurus much, enough, obfuscation is basically avoiding the question. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, but, but I watched Theresa May actually being grilled by, by somebody, it wasn't actually you, Evan, but um, on whether she knew about the nuclear mess up, you know, that sort yeah. of, the, um, and then she, she sort of obfuscated so many times that in my head she lost credibility. But why don't people just say, well, I can't, well, other than avoiding it, why can't people just say, I'm not going to tell you, and I'm being truthful as to why I'm not going to tell yes. you? That is actually one of the things I say in the book is that for me is, um, that for me is actually a, a, the, the right thing to do. Is I actually need it from your book, by the way. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> if, you need, if you need to obfuscate and you have a good reason, don't obfuscate. Just say, I'm not going to talk about that today. I'll come back to talk about that another time. Or I'm not going to talk about that because actually I don't talk about our nuclear missile tests. Or I, don't need, I only like to talk about the successful nuclear missile tests, Andrew, and I'm not going to talk about the <laughs> unsuccessful nuclear missile tests. So yeah. I suggest we move on. Um, I mean, you can say any number of things, uh, but it's much better to come across as honest yeah. uh, about why you're, you're obfuscating. Yeah. And if I, I, I mean, I have in my head Jeremy Corbyn being derailed in a set of interviews by going off piste and talking about something he hadn't meant to talk about on a day he had meant to talk about Brexit. And I, 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 you know, he just sort of said, if I talk to you about executive pay, John, you're not going to listen to me on Brexit. So I'm only going to talk to you about right. Brexit. The, every, everyone would understand. It would have been a much better thing to do. That's right. Um, than either to have pretended you've answered the question on executive pay or to have actually answered the question on executive pay, which derailed the day's headlines from where he'd wanted them to be.
Evan, one of the things you, you mentioned earlier on in our conversation that sort of caught my attention was um, the fact that there's a pressure, particularly on CEOs, and you interview them all the time at the bottom line, uh, to be aware that public, public listed companies particularly have a very much short-term quarterly thinking. They've got to try and convince shareholders they're on the right track. So, but then long-term, um, you know, that may not be uh, the case. So what, what, tell me about that pressure. Right, so, so I got into this because there is definitely a connection between your time horizon and how honest you are with other people and with yourself. So if you're very short-termist, and if the pressures are on you are really short-term, then you have an incentive to say, I don't care about my long-term reputation and what people think of me in two years. I've just got to get through the next kind of five days and everything will be fine. So if you're a company under pressure, takeover pressure, you just want the next quarterly earnings to be great, um, to get this takeover predator off your back. Um, and you're not really thinking, you know, you'll take, you'll find some way to take next year's earnings and bring them into this year to get this predator off your back not worried about the fact that it hasn't helped you next year. And, and, and worst of all, you won't really be thinking about long-term strategy and all these things. And Peter Drucker had a great phrase, which was along the lines of, 20 years of maximizing your quarterly performance is not the same thing <laughs> as maximizing your 20-year performance, yeah. which might mean minimizing your quarterly performance for the first 10 years and then maximizing them for the second 10 years. Mm -hmm. So that always going for the short-term hit uh, and sort of thinking, I'll say this now because it sounds good and I'll worry about the consequences later. That is a path to kind of, a path to get you nowhere in the long term. And I, I, I think it's true of corporate executives to some extent and there are surveys showing that they often feel they have very great pressure to, to deliver short term results. Some of them, the shocking surveys, shocking number of them say if they had to make a choice between missing a, a short-term target on quarterly earnings or doing the right thing for the company long term, they say they would probably do the wrong thing for the company yeah. long term in order to hit the target. Mm -hmm. It's amazing, really amazing. And politicians, mm -hmm. Anthony, think of politicians and the short-term pressures on them. And you could really argue that the whole structure of democratic politics is politicians making short-term claims to get them through the election, the next election, um, and thus having no reputation when it comes to the election after or the one after that because they've blown their credibility on, on the first one. Yeah. And they say, if you say to them, why do you do it? They say, well, if I, don't blow, if I don't lie to get through the first one, I won't be in the second one. So you can yeah. see the, 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 trap, the trap that they're in. But I do think uh, this is where you get into a very interesting case of um, long, how, how do we as a society try and give people long-term incentives rather than short-term incentives. It's really, really, really difficult. It's fascinating because only three weeks ago, Harvard Business Review did an evening dinner, an evening event here on that very subject of how CEOs manage short-term and long-term. They're interviewing the CEO of Heineken, and he was saying that I have to always think long-term, and I'm in my job, I've been in my job for 10 years because I do always put the long-term first. Jeff Bezos, you know, the private companies yeah. somehow could do better, can't they, because they're not under that short-term. So your advice to a CEO of a Private company think long term; they've got well, less pressure because, they're, they're, because they can. They it's can. easy for them to get away with it. My advice to the CEO of the public company who maybe feels pressure yeah. um, is to be explicit about what you're doing. So you have to keep explaining it with your voice. I mean, rather than trying to use your quarterly results to kind of signal how clever you are, you've got to say, "Look, guys." I'm not going to massage the earnings. I've taken all this other stuff out, which has made them look worse than they could look. But this is the decision I'm making for the long term. Now, you know, back me or sack me. I think, but I think you've got to, if you're going to kind of, if you're going to take risks with your own short-term reputation in order to get a long-term reputation, to, 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 to sort of minimise those risks, you've got to explain to people that's what you're doing. That's and right. if you're a politician you, and you want to be a bit more honest, You've got to, you, you better say, look, I'm, I'm trying to be a bit more honest here. Yeah. Um, I'm going to, and I, I think, you know, part of the way to do that, by the way, a really good way of doing that is when you've got good news. Yeah. When you've got the good news, either as a politician or as a, as a, as a, as a chief executive, is say, 
I don't read anything into this, right. is, to, is to give it back, is to say, no, this isn't, this isn't that good. You're a chancellor, you've got a good economic statistic. Don't say, this proves how good I am. Say, I don't read much into this. They go up and down all the time. Right. Uh, these figures, we'll have a bad one in a week's time and we'll have a good one in a month after that. And if you say that on a good day, then on the bad day, when you want to say, Wah. Things aren't so good, but stick with me. Mm. You'll be much more credible. Very good. Yeah. We're going to get back onto the subject of, of uh, post truth and everything, but just because you're talking about this with the chief executives on the bottom line, you've interviewed loads. You've done these fascinating panel sessions uh, sessions on hot topics. Is there anything that you have noticed that they all these chief executives have in common? Are they all? Then they don't. You know, it's everyone thing. I mean, they're the entrepreneurial types the ones who, if you like, created their own business, as opposed to being the managerial types who've worked their way up through a corporate bureaucracy. They're very different kinds, they're very mm. different species, really. Totally, mm. I don't think they have anything in common. I think there mm. are things in common to the entrepreneurs in terms of being quite headstrong and quite yeah. more than most of us full of self-belief. Yeah. I, I mean, to the point sometimes of delusion, but it's a, it's a helpful delusion because it helps them get up in the morning mm. and do stuff. The others, I think, are quite a mixed, yeah. quite a mixed bag, actually, and they, um, you know, you know they're, they're, they're as much variety in them as there is in any profession. I think you yeah. know, there are some who are yeah. good, some who are bad, some who are shy, some who are extrovert. I mean, yeah, they, yeah. they come in all flavours. Absolutely, right. that's good. So there's, there's many paths to the top. Yeah, yeah. yeah the bottom line: is CEOs versus the entrepreneurs on Dragon Den. I bet there's a bit of a difference there. <laughs> um, Let's talk about the uh, the very hot subject out there at the moment, and that is obviously uh, fake news. Um, I think a lot of the British public looking at the debates, for example, whether we should leave or stay in the EU, got confused with the news and the facts and everything else. Now they've got fake news to contend with. Um, but it's fascinating. You talk about some serious things in the book. You also talk about some of the lighter uh, fake news stories that got whizzed around, which <laughs> you uh, quoting you from the book saying, the BuzzFeed top 50 were women arrested for defecating on boss's desk <laughs> after winning lottery, <laughs> which really did go viral. People believed it. Obama passed law for grandparents to get all the grandchildren every weekend. <laughs> which I think horrified the grandparents. Um, and then pro-life has declared ejaculation is murder, every sperm cell is a life. So, but what's fascinating there is that they genuinely did spread. So, you know, I could today, for example, talk about companies and executives again, I could say that on Monday, you know, create some fake news that on Monday, you know, British Airways flights are going to use solar panels on the wings, they're not going to use fuel, uh, get that no news story said, sh sh um, shared out there. It's like April Fool's every day now. Exactly. Yeah, is, yeah, that, yeah. is that where we're heading? How far and I how don't think it is. is Okay, so th those examples on the BuzzFeed list, actually, most of them are not terribly dangerous. They're just stupid. And, and <laughs> you know, a woman defecates on boss's desk. It's, it's, it's quite a harmless piece of fake news. And I don't actually know whether that... I don't, I don't know how much it matters. I think, mostly, on important facts or important propositions, uh, people are... Well, let's, let, me, let, let me think this through. I think, I think, by and large, you need to worry more about the disposition of people to believe rubbish right. than you do about the people peddling the rubbish. Because most of the time, it wouldn't take very much for a sort of an individual to have some kind of personal hygiene when it comes to their uh, consumption of, of, of facts yeah. and to just see is the source reliable or not reliable. Yeah. And, and, and I have to say, I... I, mean, I the BBC gets stuff wrong. Sometimes we're guilty of, 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 of fake news, but it's never deliberate. And it's never, if it's pointed out to us, going to be for very long. Mm. Um, and I, I, I think essentially, if people don't want fake news, you don't have to have it. I mean, you yeah. just check where it's from, check yeah. the source. Okay. Is this too good to be true? Do you, is this really likely? I mean, there are sort of a million yeah. ways in which you verify the information that you get. And I, I, I just... People have to be a bit responsible. I think people just have to be a bit responsible. Maybe how gullible people are, though, aren't they? Mm. And, and why but, if it, but if it is, woman defecates on boss's desk, does that really matter? matter? I mean, you know, it's just, it's just a bit of fun, really. Yeah. It's just and I suppose the, the downside of the fact that this can go uh, viral, also there's a, the upside of, of the social media in the sense that, like Trump's earlier example, you know, it was proven incorrect. It can, that can yeah, also yeah. get, get that, out. That goes viral. But um, look, I actually think... I, 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 one of the reasons I don't like 
the, the, the slogan fake news is just because yeah. it's used as a kind of a term of abuse. But it's actually most of the arguments we have in politics and in public discourse are not about the facts as such. They're about the link between facts and judgment, and they're about the judgment. Yeah. So um, if you were to say Brexit damages the economy, the British economy, is that a fact or not? Now, to me, that doesn't seem like a fact. I would call that a judgment. Um, that most economists think it will damage the British economy, that's a fact, and I think yeah. you can say that's, that's, that, that's probably true. Uh, if you've surveyed economists, I think you'd find that. But um, the argument about Brexit is not a f an argument about the fact that most economists believe this or not. Most people would accept that's what economists think. The argument is about whether they're right or not, which is yeah. not a fact. So, look, all the interesting yeah. arguments are not about facts. They're not about yeah. fake news or unfake news. They're just about good judgment and bad judgment. And why I don't like the phrase <laughs> fake news is that people use it to say your judgment's bad. But we've always had good and bad judgment and we've had arguments about what's right and what's wrong. Where does this phrase fake news come in? If I, yeah. You know, it's just... it's. Uh, uh, presumably, the the, uh, the the whole fake news thing, if it's, is uh, good for traditional media like the BBC, like well, I think the Times, the, uh, all the the original newspapers that were struggling recently. Maybe this is a good thing because they'll go back to the sources of information that they. Well, I, I I think as you get a cacophony of unreliable sources howling around social media, uh, as that cacophony gets louder, yeah. By and large, human beings like truth when it comes to things that matter yeah. rather than incorrect or mendacious nonsense yeah. and so they will gravitate to the sources that will try and give them the truth yeah just but but you know a lot of people enjoy nonsense the yeah. national inquiry in the u.s has, has, has a lot long existed with stories of mother gives birth to baby with two tails and things like that and that's that's got a place i don't think in a way that many of the people who read it believe yeah. it no. It's very entertaining. It's, just know, it's, entertaining. Just, it's, 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 it's kind of just titillating fun. Right. But, uh, but I, look, I, I don't want to downplay yeah. the dangers of, yeah. of, of fake news, but I do think if anybody wants to protect themselves against it, it is not difficult to do. Yeah. Or it's not difficult at least to put a question mark after every bit of yeah. fascinatingly funny, reassuring or, right. or, or, you know, hilarious story that you see and to think well it may be true it may be apocryphal so go to the right source yeah. Newsnight is the right is yeah. a, is a very yeah, very BBC. good source yeah. the BBC yeah that's yeah. right yeah. Evan if we can talk about uh, spin and self-deception uh, now you, you cover very very well in, in the book and you use the example of Tony Blair where Tony Blair when he was considering going to war in Iraq actually told us the information that you know we ha he had intelligence uh, uh, that there were we weapons of mass destruction. So he did believe that. But then he also, as you say in the book, uh, according to the Chilcot report, Mr. Blair had been warned that military action would increase the threat from Al-Qaeda to the UK and to the UK interests. He had also been warned that the invasion might lead to Iraq's weapons and capabilities being transferred into the hands of terrorists, which is exactly what did happen. So presumably, looking at this, the sin, if there has been one committed, is on avoiding telling us part of the truth which actually led us down to where he wanted to go because he believed it. Is that right? So that's a very long way of saying that's a long question. Tony <laughs> Blair Tony Blair overstated in a number of ways the case for the Iraq war when he was trying to sell us the war. And that is uh, that that that's the Chilcot interpretation. They say in a number of ways he didn't point out one or two things that he'd been told that would have been against the case for war. And he didn't, he didn't equivocate over the evidence that he had. He applied a great deal of certainty to evidence that the intelligence services had said was quite, um, quite shaky. So all we need to really know is that Tony Blair overstated the case for war, according to the Chilcot report. So let's take the Chilcot report as the kind of the, 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 the best guide because they've got all the evidence and have looked at it through. Um, I think the interesting thing is that Chilcot, having said all of that, doesn't say that Tony Blair lied or that he fabricated evidence. And I think, I think that case makes what is perhaps one of the most important points about bullshit, deception and all these things, which is that there's every reason to believe Tony Blair, T Tony Blair believed what he was saying. 
and that had convinced himself w of what he was saying. And um, one reason for thinking that Tony Blair believed what he was saying and had convinced himself is that that is how most of us are <laughs> when we say stuff. Right. That we, that we, you see, uh, the classic picture of, of, of bullshit or lies is I believe X and I tell you Y. Yeah. And actually that's, it, 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 in most or a lot of the dialogue we have, I want you to believe Y for some reason, so I persuade myself that Y is true. Or my world view is that Y must be true, so I look at the world and I only see Y. Mm. And I then don't see X, which is leaping out at me. Yeah. And then I tell you that Y is what is the case rather than X is the case. And that is just such a common feature of our, of our, our mentality. In fact, it comes back to the word you use, which is cognitive dissonance. If I believe one thing or I want to believe one thing and, and, and see facts that confirm another, mm. my brain hates that discomfort. And so it kind of, it either changes the belief or has to change the facts. And if, if the facts can't be changed, it'll often change the belief. Yeah. And so you, 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 a lot of the bullshit that we get is very, very sincerely believed or mm. sincerely held. So yeah. I think that the, the kind of, the, there's a very fuzzy and blurry line between lying, self-deception, self-delusion, convincing yourself of things. And, and mm -hmm. let's, not, let's not forget, if we didn't have the power to convince ourselves of things, if we didn't have that kind of irrational power to be sometimes a bit deluded, we probably wouldn't get stuff done, which comes, comes yeah. back to some of the most effective people in the world, entrepreneurs, are often people who are capable of a great deal of self-persuasion. Yeah. And, and so that's, that comes back to the sort of story, actually Ian Leslie yeah. wrote it in a book, a, a story about um, <clears throat> how you kind of need to be blessed with a little bit of, of delusion and self-deception because that makes you a better liar when you need right. to lie. Yeah. <laughs> and it makes you a, it, it, it allows you to take on the world and make sense of the world more easily Interesting. than you would uh, if you didn't do that. That's why they say every, every good lie has got an element of truth in yeah. it. Yeah, um, quite, or, quite or, true. Or, well. or my aunt, who's the best storyteller in the world, uh, always says, "Never let the truth get in the way of a good story." Yeah, yeah. So all these, all these people. It's, <laughs> but as you say, there's a it's a power, isn't it? It can either be used for a force of good or for bad. So Tony Blair, in this instance, then, it was just believing that he seemed to be doing the right thing for the country. There wasn't any malice in there, but he just fell to. Well, a, I don't. A, I don't want to impugn or no. impute any um, intention to Tony Blair because I don't know what goes on inside his head. Sure. What I would say is. It is quite common for people to persuade themselves of things, and he yeah. may well have persuaded himself of it. Yeah. Who knows? Maybe he thought it was all rubbish and wanted to just lie to us. I don't yeah. know. But all I would also say is, is that if the war had gone very successfully and everyone said this was the best thing we ever did Zero. in hindsight, I don't expect we would have had as much of an investigation into the, the, the flawed case for war beforehand. Um, so there's a very big link between the fact that the policy failed, yeah. um, or was perceived to have failed, and the fact that the case when you go back and look at the case, the case uh, appears to have been a bit, uh, a bit flawed. Yeah, that's right. And therefore, that led to us invading that event, that led to the ISIS vacuum creating, the whole migration problem. So that shows the danger of system one, system two thinking, not actually thinking through and going with your own self-belief and cognitive dissonance yeah. and all that type of stuff, which is why everyone should read your book before they make any other decisions. Um, OK, so the bottom line is then, um, as we learned today, there's a lot of uh, dangers. There's a lot of um, you know, it's not it's not a simple um, concept. The whole exactly. thing about post truth. It's not it's not black and white. No, it's quite grey. Yeah, um, and we're all guilty of it, and it has its good uses as well as its bad uses. Yeah, and understanding the good will help you know when you're using it pushing it too far. Brilliant. And for a communicator, there's nothing wrong with embellishing or exaggerating, or as you said, a bit of theatre, as long as it doesn't get down too far down to that. Correct. Um, and Correct. having a long-term thinking, not short-term thinking. And then, as, and it's always going to be fun watching people like you, Evan, who, whose job, I guess, is to uh, spot this b bullshit on our behalf. Like, um, for example, let's talk about your role at the, at the BBC. Um, Norman Betterson, uh, the former South Yorkshire Police Chief Inspector, 
later uh, that you interviewed um, wrote a book called The Hillsborough Untold. And then The Mirror said, I don't read it every day, but uh, The Mirror said, quote, he went on Newsnight uh, on Tuesday to try to plug it, and within seconds, Evan Davis exposed him for the duplicitous snake he really is. Um, so that's their word, is not mine. That I is his word. That's, sorry, that's the mirror's word. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I presented him with a, ca a view of him because he's, yeah. he's much hated in parts of the country. Yeah. Uh, and I presented him with that view and let him make his case. <laughs> and the viewer decides. The viewer decides exactly. That those are the words or or not. So Evan, we're all in communications, uh, as you've uh, rightly said, but. Um, for the communication professionals walking, watching this video with director of communications, what advice do you give to those to that group? Well, I, I think it's this. Above all, you need to think about your objectives and your time horizon. So that's that, that, that's number one. But beyond that, I think we are, or the public, will be putting more weight on honesty, integrity, and authenticity, and not on. Um, uh, well, it's going to put, they're going to put weight on those things. Now, that, a lot of businesses say that. This just sounds like the same old flannel as everybody says. But I think it has a very important implication. You have a choice between the hard sell approach, in which you argue your case or sell your product very hard, or the soft sell, in which you basically talk about the deficiencies in your argument. You may talk about the weaknesses of your product and then talk about the strengths of your argument and the strengths of your product. Now, choosing between the hard sell and the soft sell, the hard sell is going to ram home the merits of your case more effectively. The soft sell is going to ram home your authenticity and honesty more effectively. Now, my view is, is that in more cases than people realise, coming across as honest is a more persuasive thing in making a case than making the case strongly. So if I was out there mm -hmm. trying to sell nuclear power as a sort of concept, for example, I could go on the Today programme and say, it's safe, it's cheap, it's better than wind power, you know, this other, the other's rubbish. No, all these, you know, I could spew out statistics to prove my case. I could do that. And then you'd say, well, he really made the case strongly. But probably everybody who's listening to me is thinking, this guy's just a nuclear nut and he's, he's trying to sell me nuclear power. So we're all discounting everything I'm saying every, right. as, as quickly as I said. Or I could go on and I could sort of, I could take the soft approach. I could say, well, you know, it's not ideal nuclear power. It's more expensive than gas, but hey, we're not going to have gas forever and gas is burning carbon into the atmosphere. So we need nuclear. We worry about the safety, you know, and we do worry about the cost, but on balance, it seems better to go with nuclear. Now, if you put it in that soft way, well, then people think this, this guy seems like he's thought about it and he sort of knows what he's talking about and he's, he's not a nut, he's, he's, he's kind of thought, thinking it through. And that might be a more convincing way of making the case than arguing it very strongly and sounding like you're hard selling. So, I mean, for me, quite a lot of this era is about dropping the hard sell and coming across as honest by being honest. And, and if you are honest, people will think, yes, this is the person who, this is the person who I would like to trust to make a decision on whether we have more nuclear power or not, because this person looks like they're going to think about it as opposed to just, you know, stick to the thought they first had. So I, th I think that's quite an important implication. And always for professional communicators, the overriding kind of theme of the book is, yes, you've got a job, but your job is not to to defy gravity. The truth will out in the end, Anthony. That is, you know, you're not going to make the NHS better by spinning the stats. You're not going to make your product good by telling us it's good quality if it isn't. You know, you might, you might get sales for a week, but in the long term, you know, it comes back to bite you and you, it all ends up being, it all ends up being a waste of effort. So go with where the honesty is mm. and you're more likely to get, get results than, than, than you probably think. That would be refreshing when I watch Question Time and uh, the Labour Party over the NHS in, in Wales, they say, yes, it is a mess, as opposed to Constance saying it's great. And, you know, because it does become very binary, doesn't it? So, so it's, it's, it's about not just always spinning as a habit. Yeah, exactly. It's about looking like you're a both. sensible human being who, ha who can cope with, you know, failure as well as success. And I, I, I just, my feeling at the moment is, and I'm sure this isn't always true, that there is something of a yearning for those kinds of people in public discourse. Now, I might be wrong, maybe people want the kind of bombast of a Donald, Tr Donald Trump and uh, 
you know, they're not so worried about facts. But actually, I, I, think, I think not. And I think if you, if you think of the last year as the year in which Donald Trump's unique style <laughs> has, has taken the world by storm, for better or for worse, um, those who don't want to be a Donald Trump have to find a kind of a new form of their own form of discourse. And it's no point in going back to where it was five years ago when it was worn out already, the, the, the old bullshit. They're going to have to find something that is different to Trump and different to, to what they had before. And I think, I think there is something to be found there that, that is a bit more self-effacing and a little, bit less, uh, a little bit less forcefully projecting and which comes across as a bit more thoughtfully responsible. Because as leaders, we're always told integrity is the most important part of leadership. As kids, we always tell our kids not to lie. And then you watch Donald Trump lying on television. So it's good that Evan Davis is actually saying there is hope for a better day and honesty can prevail. Yeah, well, I think honesty, I think the truth does come out in the end. And, and I, I, in the book, I do mention one or two cases where great liars have gone on to great things, but they, come, they do come unstuck. I mean, it's very hard... It's very hard to, to keep it going forever. Now, if, you, if, you, if your time horizon is only for as long as the lie needs to survive, then fine. Uh, that's probably going to be your best strategy. But I think if you, if you sort of want to go to the grave, um, you should work on this. If you want to go to the grave with a good reputation, you should work on the assumption that by the time your life is over, you will have the reputation that you deserve. Good stuff. For Evan, I just want to say on behalf of the viewers uh, watching it, and I know you're a very busy man, so thanks for spending your, your, your time with thanks us very today. Much Thank, you, Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.